We're on holiday break. Here's the best of 2020 featuring Billy Decker. Enjoy. Hey, it's Joe West from the West Barn with Mike Shimshack. And our guest is world-class mixer Billy Decker. Hello. Hey. Welcome. Hello, Mike. Hello, Joe. Billy Decker is a Nashville, not a worldwide mixer, but uh, he's based out of Nashville. Um, has mixed over 25 million records in sales, RIA certified. Uh, producer, engineer, mixer, focusing mostly on mixing, as most people do. They gather, they get up in their career and they end up just doing the one thing. And um, Grammy nominated, plug in. Didn't win, but sure. <laughs> has, his, has a plug in that is uh, a signature plug in. Yes. Through, through uh, JST, Joey Sturgis Tones. Right, and um, is mixing most of the things you hear on the radio. Has over 25 number ones? Uh, I'm at about 16 Billboard country charting ones, but uh, if you count Canada, pop, rock, indie, it's probably, you know, so you're whatever do, chart you're, you're doing. doing all right. You're going to do this next year. I'm, go I'm not going anywhere anytime soon. Well, I was talking to Billy before we went on, and I, I heard a mix uh, that stunned me that he had done for uh, Colt Ford. He mixed a bunch of records, but in particular, Noah Gordon, the producer of that record, had sent it over to me, and um, it just was one of those records when I heard it. I was like, who did this? You know, and when, it, that's a cool thing in the music business. You go find that person and see what they're all about. Then I see all your posts. You're mixing out of a room with um, All in the Box. Correct. Which is stellar for people if, you know, if people want to learn from somebody and you're at home and you're in the box... Billy Decker's that guy. Um, are you doing much of that? As far as? Education and... You know, I got asked to be on a, a program called Nail the Mix, which is an educational forum. They've got like 4,000 students worldwide. It's tied in with Joey Sturgis, A.L. Levy, and Joel Wanasek. Uh, and I did a eight hour segment where they come and film and it's literally like sitting right next to me and they have predominantly it's in the metal world and the rock guys do it i was the first non-metal guy to do it and i ended up because i mixed so fast most people do one song i did like five you know right. so and that comes probably out of a history of mixing demos right it does it does i can remember as a kid i was always complaining as a mix engineer like man that's no fair those guys get to spend a whole day on a mix i only get two hours because i was in pittsburgh and was, there was budgets yeah and then i got a gig where they said we want you to take all day and after two hours i didn't know what to do <laughs> <laughs> now if i if i spend longer than probably 45 minutes on a song i'll go backwards i'll start rethinking it and so you're mixing whole songs in about an hour oh yeah i did uh um, wow God, I did a Trace Adkins record, I think, in two days way back when. We were under a time crunch. Now, granted, the producer came in and made all his tweaks and stuff, but my shape, you know, just to put it in the, the box to get it ready to start tweaking, was about 45 You're minutes. You're working off mixed templates and the whole thing? I do, yeah. I learned early on uh, that I didn't want to be the guy that came in at 7.30 in the morning and go home at 11.30 at yeah. night. Yeah. I had two little kids at the time. Now they're grown. And my wife was like, you're not home. You're not raising the kids. Everybody's miserable. I'm all about balance. You know what I mean? So tell me, the, what's, a, what's your template look like? What You sit down, open up a file, Take me from there to minute 45. Like, tell, just ballpark it and tell me where you're at and what you're doing, how you systematically go through it. Sure. So what I learned to do early on to get me home sooner was I would mix a song and I liked the sound of that song and I learned that you could open up a brand new session, import session data and not the audio. So I'm basically like taking the skin so I have my tracks right here. I'm pulling the skin right down there. All the EQ, the session was mixed. I'm just deleting the audio. And then I take uh, the audio and drag it down individually, track by track into my template. I hit play and it's 95% there. Wow, isn't that something? And over the years I've refined it and I've got a folder on my desktop that says templates. There's probably 20 in there. Somebody called me the other day. I mixed a song for a guy named uh, Dustin Lynch. The song was called Small Town Boy. And they're like, man, we really like the snare sound from Small Town Boy. I'm like, okay, let's do it. So I just pulled okay. the template that I used for that song. 
and all the EQs were the same and whatnot. And I added my samples and it was pretty close, you know, as far as the sonic shape, the client wanted that style, you know. Do you always like use your own samples in the stuff? Pretty much, yeah. Part of your sound kind of thing? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm, I, On every song you're using samples, you think? Or? Almost, yeah. Ever since I started mixing, uh, I realized I hate the sound of real drums. Because <laughs> my brother used to As play. As a country mix engineer, that's going to be a challenge. Oh, that's I know. Amazing. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I know. I'm, I'm winning lots of friends with that statement, aren't I? <laughs> Uh, I love drummers. I just hate the sound. I grew up with my little brother playing drums, and I hated the sound coming out of the bedroom, and it hurt my ears. I was always covering them up and stuff. And then uh, because I'm 52, I grew up kind of in the Mutt Lang, Def Leppard area, Brian Adams. So I'm a huge drum replacement guy. Drums are life. I have a, I have a little slogan I always tag on stuff called kick drums sell records. <laughs> yeah, well, your mixes are drum heavy. Yeah, they are. They like, are. They're probably least, lopsided to a bad way, but oh well. And, you know, I'm listening like when you're holding your phone up showing a mix, it's like the kick and snare are always like, wow, mm -hmm. they're really in front and it's like, you know, it draws your attention. So it's not that you dislike them, it's just that you don't like the way. <laughs> now, do you get drummers complaining about that? Saying, I, hey, man, you took my snare away. Or... Yeah, oh, yeah. So basically what I've learned to do is keep the real snare always for all the rudiments and the stick bouncing on the head and whatnot and the ghost notes. And then I just supplement the twos and the fours for the most yeah, part. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then if there is a fill where it's like a press roll, the you know, all you do is just automate up the real and then you it masks the non-existent samples in there you know yeah so if you look at one of my sessions you'll see anytime there's a little drum fill on the real snare it'll go boop 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 whenever there's like a press roll or something right like what do you that. use to trigger uh trigger uh slate trigger, trigger two no i use the original one trigger one uh they don't even make it anymore what's the difference i see that in my plugin i just never use it it is easier to read the graphics are easier and uh, now that I'm getting older, I have to squint. So anything that's big and easy to use, I always gravitate towards. <laughs> right. So I just did, uh, I'm on Pro Tools 10, and um, a friend of mine works at Slate. Uh, his name's Flynn Lemagne. He's a R and d in charge of all the hardware stuff. So they asked me to try out that Slate mic, and they sent me some plugins too. And I said, by chance, do you have something that'll load in Pro Tools 10? So they literally went back and found me a legacy bridge so I can use all oh, the plugins amazing. in Pro Tools. Because that's the problem, right? And how do you deal with like opening sessions that are too far forward? Do you have that problem? Or will uh, 10 open everything? 10 will open everything. Yeah. I had that problem for a while when I was going kicking and screaming from an earlier version. And I'd have to go to a studio, sit backwards, save it and whatnot. But 10 will open everything. It will. And it's funny. I was on Pro Tools 8 up until about five years ago. And before that, I was on five, and I mixed a song called uh, Going Through Hell for a guy named Rodney Atkins. Oh, and yeah. it was like, it did pretty good. Great you know? guy. Huge song. But it was funny because I had no idea about delay compensation because it wasn't even existed. So, I mean, I had samples in there. And if you go back and listen now, I mean, it's so, there's stuff out of phase. It's crazy. But it didn't matter. You know? Right. Yeah. So, and I had stuff peaking, probably distorting. I always mix real, real hot, you know? I always push it so it taps the red. Anytime I do a video or something, everybody's like, what are you doing? Because your faders are up here, and then I just pull my master down. Right. As opposed to most people put their master at zero yeah. and bring fade. I always got used to hitting option and clicking on the fader, and yep. it would snap to zero. Yeah. And I got so used to that that I just kept pulling down and down. So now I was mixing a song yesterday. My two bus was minus 12.4. <laughs> <laughs> so and, and why so do you mix backwards. so hot? Uh, just because I got used to clicking the faders up to zero. That was like my starting spot. Okay, so not for a sonic reason. No, no. There's, there's absolutely zero logic. Uh, studio manager over at Soundstage, where I was at for about 17 years, came in and goes, you know, I would love to give you a piece of advice, but... Everything you do is backwards. It makes zero sense, but it still works. Still sounds good. He's yeah. like, so I'm not going to tell you what to do. Yeah. So I figure, hey, all you do is turn it down super, super low. If it ain't distorting, you're fine. Now, did you start off like on tape machines? And I did, yeah. Uh, I used to be able to align a Studer A80 A A in about 20 minutes. So I did an internship out in San Francisco, and there was a big Trident console out there. and. Mm. 
tape machines and all that stuff. But I just, I, I wanted to learn how to work faster. And I saw back when Mix Magazine used to be the, the magazine. Now it's, I don't know what it is now. You know, it's right. about that thin and a couple <laughs> advertisements. I was never in that. That was my goal to do it. But I always saw like guys like Chris Lord Algae and Bob Clear Mountain. And I'm like, those guys are the rock stars of the engineering world. So I'm like, that's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to be a mixer. So I started telling everybody that all I do is mix. And a friend of mine was a tracking engineer and he loved that. And I'm like, well, you give me all your work. I'll take all your mix work and we'll feed each other. 17, well, 25 years later, we're both still here rocking. That's cool. You know? Do you track at all ever? I haven't since probably 2001. Wow. So I used to, and I used to run without an assistant because I couldn't afford one back then doing demos in Nashville. So how many songs a day would you say you do right now? <sighs> Five to seven. Oh my! And where, where are you, where's all the is the work just coming from? Just relationships you've built. And it is. It's all word of mouth. Uh, every morning I wake up and check my email, and there's a song in there to be mixed or yeah. songs. Uh, it's cool. the craziest thing, you yeah. know. I mean, we all, as an engineer, you'll have that period. Usually, it's in the. For me, it's early spring or late fall where it just. <clears throat> Yeah. Phone stops ringing. You're like, the dream's over. Uh, it's dead. Everybody hates me. I'm moving to Florida. I'm going to dig palm tree holes for the rest of my life. You know, I'm done. And this, as soon as I stop worrying about it, the phone rings again. You know, yeah. so that's why I learned how to pick up hobbies like we were talking the woodworking. And yeah, I see a lot of that on Now I bought a motorcycle. Not as nice as yours, Joe, but I'm going to try to rebuild it. It's just something to get your mind off the music business. And then it seems to take care of itself. So. Yeah. So when you were working on these large format consoles, you completely in the box, you don't have anything that's like, oh man, I wish I could put a CL1B on that or an LA2A or mm -hmm. 1176. Is that out of speed and recallability that you don't do that? Or is it just because you don't care and you think it's just as good? Uh, I think that argument really held water before we got to the generation of converters where we are now, you know? Uh, back when I was doing that, like I said, that no delay compensation, all that, obviously there was probably a sonic difference, you know, it sounded pretty plastic or whatnot, but now I think it's caught up. And for me, it's, if I mix something on a console or if I mix something in Pro Tools all in the box and they both hit the radio, I would dare you to go, oh, that was mixed in Pro Tools or that was Nuendo or that's right. Reaper or that's a console. Sure. You can't tell, yeah. you know. I think maybe back in the day that held some merit, but now, I mean, it's almost the industry well, What's standard. the difference in time? Like if you're on an SSL versus in your room, one song, what's the difference in time? Uh, I could mix a song in the time it took to recall the console. <laughs> That's amazing. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So uh, I don't like to brag about this because uh, people are going to be, oh, he doesn't care. He, he just throw and go. But just as a, a point of how efficient you can be if you do it, there was a songwriter named Michael Delaney. You guys might know him. Uh, back in probably 1998, maybe 2000, uh, he came to me right before Christmas and said, I just did a triple session, demo session. I'm going to Colorado with my family to visit my folks or California or wherever it was, it, maybe it was wife's family. And he goes, I've got to get these songs done and turned in so I can meet my quota on my publishing deal to meet my, you know, whatnot. So he gave them to me on a Thursday night, 17 songs. I came in at 7.30 in the morning over at a studio called County Q. I remember County Q. Yeah. And I worked all the way up till 7 o'clock. And then he came in and he goes, all right, just give me a verse and a chorus. Done. Print. Turn the vocal up. Print. Boom. Boom. We got out of there 11 at night and we did 17 songs. Wow. And he turned them Holy in. Crap. Four of them got cut within wow. three weeks after that new year. That's amazing. Yeah. But it was funny because I went home and my ears were just like, woo, woo, woo. you know, it was, oh, it was awful. Yeah. It was like being at the worst, loudest rock concert ever. Well, you're part of the, you're part of the guys, I think, that people credit as adding some excitement into the mix in country music. Like, you're not afraid of, you're not afraid of compression, you're not afraid of a little distortion here and there. Right, right. You know, it's like, and it's excitement. You know, like that's what excitement feels like, mm -hmm. you know? So I've heard your name mentioned many times as one of the people that kind of have 
helped push country music and oh, what it sounds like. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, it's cool. My uh, my whole thing is bigger is better, louder <laughs> is better. <laughs> so why not? You know, it's amazing. So when you're doing the, you've got 17 songs done in a day. Mm -hmm. Like, how do you have work for the next day? I mean, it just seems like. Where it would take someone two weeks to do that and three weeks three, with recalls, right? I mean, if it was a record that was being put out and not rushed. Like, how do you keep the incoming work? Uh, it just keeps coming. Just keeps coming. Yeah, I think after, uh, because I came up through the demo world doing so, uh, we're in Nashville. So, yeah. I mean, you could literally make a great living if you did nothing but demos, yeah. you know? Right. All through the 90s and all the way up till probably... Well, even now, you know. Sure. Uh, so I learned to work fast and I made enough relationships and hopefully haven't burned the bridges. One thing I've always done is my dad always said, say what you're going to do and then do what you say and then some, you know. I offer always, I've never charged for recalls. So even on demos. And because I use the template system, I do the exact same thing on a demo as I do on a master. So I think people kind of equate me working fast, but they also go, you know what? He does for our demos exactly what he's going to do for a record. And we know that we can call him in two weeks and go, hey, could you put that guitar lick up one more dB, blah, blah. And I'm like, yeah, no problem. I stop what I'm doing, snap up 100% recall, bounce down the song three minutes, email it, get back to what I'm doing. Yeah. So an average day for me, I will show up and the first hour, maybe two, is recalls, you know, from past stuff. What kind of recalls are we talking? Like vocal up a little bit? Like, oh, uh, yeah, kind of. Uh, like, what's the most common request? Is it? Yeah, more, vocal more, up, more, guitar, more fact so down the guitar. Drums down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, put, in, put in the real snare, take out the sample. <laughs> but no, um, everybody kind of. For the most part, I tell everybody, I'll put you in that box and I'll put you in the picture frame. It's like painting a picture, mixing to me. Uh, if you put something on top of something, you're not going to see it. So we need to move it with panning, depth with spatial effects, or up and down with volume. You know, I'll paint the picture. Anything you want to do within the frame, that's fine. I don't care. That's, uh, that's, that's a critical part of being successful. Yeah. So many guys get their ego hurt by oh, like oh, provisions in their crush. So many their people souls I know. crushed. Yeah. By like, oh, they what, they didn't they didn't call me right away when I sent them the mix, or they got back to me and it wasn't like a paragraph of accolades before a cup a small revision, <laughs> right? You know, people. Uh, part of the secret is like, hey, it's your record. Mm -hmm. I want you to be happy. And like, but there are parts where like, I had a client recently where a year later he tells me I had done a, a record for him, mixed a record. We mastered it with Ted Jensen. He had me bring the vocal down two dB, which is pretty drastic. Yeah. And I thought it was fine. I thought it still worked, but I like vocals loud, so I put it loud. A year later, he had me go back and put it up to dB. But it's like <laughs> there's a gray area where things are still right. It's yeah. like, okay, this is not, this is not a, um, we aren't in the area where we're failing in execution. This is subjective, right? So your, your area is like, hey, whatever they want, it's their record. But do you get to a point where you say, hey, that vocal... I don't think that is in the best interest of the record to be that low. We're so low now that it's, it's in a problem area. How do you deal with those? Uh, a good friend of mine, Jeff Giuliano, great mixer. Uh, he laughs and says, I want to quote you on that Decker because I told him I was the McDonald's of mixers. <laughs> so <laughs> instead of asking, all I do is I'm customer service. And I try to instill that in people when I'm speaking at those conferences or whatnot, the education, instead of, you know, somebody asking, hey, you want pickles and ketchup on that burger? I just say, hey, do you want a little reverb and delay on your mix? I am nothing more than customer service. And anything anybody asks me, I will definitely do. Uh, if it starts to get close to that frame or if I do have an opinion right. uh, and it warrants it, sure, I'll speak up. Yeah. But I definitely know when my opinion is not wanted. So, and uh, I've got, I th I'd like to say I've got a very good barometer, a self-ego barometer, you know? Um, my wife will say, now I know why you're so crabby when you come home. It's because everybody's kicking you in the nuts all damn day long. You know? <laughs> I'm that guy. Hey, go ahead. Give me another, you know? Go ahead. Turn around and kick Thank me. you, sir. I have another. But at the end of the day, I'm just 
smiling and thinking about my beach house someday. Yeah, that's cool, man. <laughs> cool. It, that leads us to our next question. If you're obviously working by the song, not by the hour, if you're working this fast. Correct, correct. <laughs> so tell me, if somebody, how much of your work is completely insider work, where it's either publishing relationships or major label stuff, and how much time do you get to work on indie band from Kansas? Uh, the exact same amount. So uh, from day one, I charge $200 for a demo. Uh, then I will go, uh, if you want to release something, it's like 500 bucks for an indie record. People from Norway call me, whatnot, you know. Uh, then I'll go up to major label stuff, which is 2,500 a song, which is pretty standard around here, yeah. you know. Uh, I will work as long on a $200 demo as I will 25. It, it, right. I, I really don't mind, you know, it, it doesn't matter. To me, I treat everything like it's a $2,500 record. Yeah. And that has, because I've learned to work so fast, it's no big deal, you know? You right, guys right. can call me and I'll just, boom, back on your record. Oh, phone rang again, yeah, I'll get you before I go home. How much of your work is still demos? Boy, what, what percentage would you say? It used to be, Boy, starting out, it was a lot, you know? Sure. And then I would say now it's... The majority of work now is indie, indie record. And especially over this coronavirus sure. yeah, pandemic yeah. thing, yeah. Uh, I've actually stayed pretty steady because everybody wants to release content. Sure. Uh, but I would say demos where they used to be 90, 80% of the work now is probably 30% with independence making up the rest and then records are 10, 20%, right, gotcha. you know? So here's the secret that no one knows is that you keep doing the demos, if not just for the money, you keep doing them because you get your record work out of them. Because oh. the songwriter that 100%. has the demo with you says is we want Billy next, Decker to mix it. Or is the next producer. So it's like, you can't just say like, oh, I'm above that, I'm too good for that. I don't mix demos, I don't do demos, I'm a, like this epic dude. Mm -hmm. You realize that the next year, 80% of your work is coming from those guys that have their first hit and maybe they're producing the record. Absolutely. I would rather be in practicing, working on a demo, trying new things. Uh, it's a little more laid back. Everybody's not, oh, it's gotta be blah, 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 blah. Because like a record, everybody's sure. just rah, rah, rah. But with a demo, everybody's like, yeah, cool, you know, try something, you know? Give me a, a organic drum sound that you never do, Decker, you know? Right, so cool. I can practice, you know? That's cool. <laughs> Trying to mix a, like a Chris Stapleton record or, you know, a Miranda Lamb or something that's a little more organic sounding. Uh, but friends of mine or other engineers, not necessarily friends of mine, are sitting on the couch sucking the salt off Fritos waiting for the phone to ring, right, you know? Right. Where I'll, I'll go in, I'll mix five demos still take a thousand bucks home yeah, why not absolutely right that's insane you yeah. know to say you don't want to mix something on your on your master stuff you're mixing are you sending it to the labels and stuff fully limited <laughs> like, uh, and I, then going to master taking the limiter off uh, yes i have a couple good friends that are mastering guys and i don't claim to be a mastering engineer but i've sat in with them long enough and they've told me how to do it and shown me how to do it so I will offer that a mastered version to my clients as well as an unmastered version. And basically all I do is take that limiter off. Yes. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And uh, who are the mastering guys that you end up using the most? Andrew Mendelson, uh, Jim Domain over at Yes Masters. And I used to use Hank Williams a lot before he... Not the Hank Williams. No. <laughs> so everybody <laughs> The knows. mastering Hank Williams. Right. right. So those were about the, the only three. Uh, I've never gotten to have Ted Jensen or anything slam a mix. I think that'd be pretty cool. You know he's in town now, right? I do know that, yeah. He's got a great facility over in East Nashville. Oh, yeah. And he's, uh, he's the louder is better guy, in my opinion. He does all that big <laughs> All right, this is a great, a great point. So now that we have the way our music gets consumed, this is going to... It lives on the internet now, right? Mm -hmm. So we don't have to battle to be the loudest person on the LP. We don't have to battle to be the loudest person on CD. And that's because, you know, on, on those finite 
products, it can only, it's like a cup of coffee. It can only hold so much coffee. So everybody was doing the same thing. They were shaving off the top of every record and they were trying to get the body of the record up, the loudness of the record, so that whenever they were on a compilation, Pearl Jam would sound a half a dB louder than Soundgarden and people, loud is better, end of story. Now the world is, hey, all these algorithms, they're all based off of the same philosophy, which is they look at loudness. They listen to the RMS or the body, the mm, what you hear outside of a Jeep. They listen to that, they match that level. Now, if you're the guy that's super loud and crushing the top end, they have now taken your mix and turned it way down mm -hmm. and they took dude that left all the peaks in and they made the mm just as loud, but now he has all his peaks and you don't. So now you sound anemic. So how do you deal with that? I learned the hard way. I <laughs> mixed Rodney Atkins' <laughs> latest record and it went to iTunes and he was like, dude, it's quieter than everybody else. What the hell? You're supposed to be that, that guy. So I made a few phone calls and sure enough, that's what it was. Yeah. yeah. So I resent over stuff to be mastered without that limiter and then they adjusted and boom, now we're fine. That's good. Right. But yeah, I learned the hard way. Well, and the other thing that happens is like, if you really listen, there was a great thing on YouTube where they were taking the track, uh, putting it in mono and reversing the polarity and comparing the, the limited master to the unlimited. And when you do that, what happens? And I don't even think they put it in mono. I think they left it because they were exact. Left was exact, right was exact. And what was left was the process, the distortion that was left by the limiter, by oh, the wow. summing. Yeah. And when I heard that, I was like, oh, wow. I don't like that. It sounded like a blown speaker trying to, you know, it sounded like a really small speaker blown. And I always wanted my records to be louder, but I found the more I limited, the more I took out the energy, the life of the record. So it's a del delicate balance. But it also, people say, hey, do you leave all that stuff on your two bus? You know, I don't know if you do, you have two bus that you load heavily. Mm -hmm. So two bus is where all your faders come down to the left and right, what people would hear in their headphones. And that goes out the end of your console, the end of your workstation, and that's what gets saved as the file. And a lot of guys that are big mixers do a lot of work on that two bus. And people don't understand. It's like a lot of people aren't using compression to compress. They're using it to make the record feel like it's on a chain, feel mm -hmm. like it's this beast that's trying to come out of your speakers. But that also works against you if you're using limiting to do that. What are you using to get that aggressive sound that you get? Is it a lot of two bus stuff, individual stuff? Where does that, where does that sound, if there is a Billy Decker sound, where does that sound happen? On your faders or on your two bus? Uh, probably on the faders, but then the two bus is an EQ and it's always high passed at about 32.5 hertz. That's, just, that's the SSL thing, right? Isn't that the SSL where they roll off? They do, but I don't know if that's the frequency. The only reason I do that is because there's a guy named Kevin Churko that mixes like a band called Five Finger Death Punch oh, yeah, and a bunch sure. of stuff. And he worked with Mutt Lang and Mutt Lang's never been wrong. And if he learned that from <laughs> Mutt Lang, then that's where it needs to be. Right. So, uh, and then I go into a Kramer Pie yep. and hit it at three to one and I just barely tick it back. If you do it too much, I mean, there's a, another engineer that I really like and I'm friends with his name, Dan Corniff. And he used to mix um, a lot of stuff for David Bendith. He did like the Paramore record yeah, yeah, and stuff sure. like that. And um, he will take that needle and it's like, goo, 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 goo. and I'm like, I just, I don't know how he does it. I, and then he'll turn up the output and I'm like, Mine sounds like butt, you know? <laughs> but that's the beauty of it. Like, you can give, all the great engineers give away all their secrets because they realize that it's really, it's in the fingertips somehow. I mean, there's, you can do the same exact gags that you take from other people, but it, your mix sounds different because mm -hmm. you've got this DNA of where you like your snare to push and yeah. where it's crossing the threshold on your two mix. It's an interesting thing. Um, I got to work with Frank Filippetti, mm -hmm. which I'm a big fan of, and it was on a Phil Ramone was producing. Frank Filippetti was the engineer, and I was there mixing a record. It was at a private studio, and I just decided to stay around Frank and said, hey, stick around, and you can help us out. So I watched Frank go through this whole session with Simon Phillips and Bunny Burnell and great band and, of course, Phil Ramone. And I remember the whole time as a kid, I was like, I do that. That's the mic I use. Oh, that's where I put my overheads. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I totally, that's the mic free I use. That's the compressor. I do it the same way. And then as I was preoccupied with Pat myself on the back, he had brought the faders up. And it was this thing where it was just like, <laughs> it never sounds like that. For right. Me. It's right. a beauty of, you can get, we'll eventually get to an algorithm-based 
solution where you hit a button and it's Billy, Billy Decker mix and it will go through all your mixes and analyze right. them. And Chris and Tom and all the folks. But it's never going to be the same. Recalls aren't the same. When you were in your SSL, mm-hmm. you'd spend an hour and a half recalling it. You'd sit down and you go, doesn't sound the same. But there is something that is, is individualistic about it. You can, nobody really, a lot of the great guys that I know were f- really free to give their secrets because they, they know this. They know that you're going to go and do something that will be in your DNA that will make it different. Oh, yeah. Uh, Such a cool thing about music. I've given my template to uh, before I went on that school, which literally shows if it's like sitting next to me for eight hours. I give up the ghost on everything. And before I did it, uh, I gave my template and the same audio to two engineer dudes I know and say, please try to copy me. And it started out, and then all of a sudden he went this way because his ears pull him this way. And right. That went that way. When they got done, they sent them back. It wasn't even close. Yeah. So That's I'm cool, like, though, right? It's cool. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's great. If it's good. I mean, yeah. So I tell everybody, they go, hey, what's your favorite plug-in? And I just go, boom, right there. You know? Yeah. yeah. Uh, but back to the two bus. Uh, yeah, I don't mind telling anybody or any anything. Uh, then I put the Sony Oxford inflator on. Yep. And uh, usually you don't go above four on the input level. Don't let it get more than four lights. Otherwise, that'll cause you trouble. Uh, and then I'll put on that Oxford, the limiter maximizer or ozone, whatever that thing's ozone, called. Yeah. And I use ISRC or not ISRC. Four. Two. Two. Number okay. two. And... Uh, the transient thing is about halfway up and then minus 0.1 on the output level and it's just knocking it back a couple dB, but my master fader just goes oh, yeah. on or off, you know? Yeah. The ozone, the ozone's tough to take off, man. <laughs> yeah. you? Well, what I love about the ozone is after you're sick of yourself, you can say, hey, mm, CD, medium, and just let it figure it out. And you can be like, oh, I just hired a mastering, another opinion that you didn't have before. I like a lot of the um, presets for that too because like if you're like, I'm kind of uninspired. I'm just going to browse through these, see which one starts to interest me, and then you tweak it. Oh, yeah. yeah and it's, a great th- it's a great point to come from. Let's talk about your plugins with Joey Sturgis. Yes. Uh, after I did that school uh, and did that uh, eight-hour thing, the Joey Sturgis, who's famous for mixing in the box a bunch of metal emo bands and whatnot, you know, uh, came up to me. He goes, you know, you and I are so similar watching you do that for eight hours. The only difference is our source material. You're Banjo Billy. I'm like hard rock, you know, dude. He goes, man, I'd really like to capture what you do and put it in a plugin. So I provided him with everything I use and his code guy, you know, and audio and then they would run it through and go okay Decker's using like a FET style compressor like a 1176 thing so then at four to one and he's knocking it back you know four db or something so they would use their code of their 1176 models and put that there and then boom 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 uh so my plugins are no they're dynamic only eq and dynamic or is eq dynamic or is that compression? It can, be, it can be if it's a dynamic. <laughs> There's no EQ. effects, no verb, no delay. Right. So it's only compression and EQ. Gotcha. Uh, and then they're called a bus glue series because they're supposed to. Boy, I talk off my hands, don't I? Damn it. I think somebody told it's me that good. one time. I'm like, no, I don't. But You're I like just Steve Mark Antonio. <laughs> <laughs> oh, by the way, funny story. He called me. Uh, he calls me sausage guy. Because one time at the I'm sound sure kitchen, does. I was like. Obviously, you're Italian. Where can I find the best Italian sausage in town? And that's stuck with him ever since. So he goes, what's up, sausage guy? That's amazing. <laughs> uh, great engineer, by the way. Uh, so, yeah, the plugins are meant to be like a one and done. You just put them on, and every single button has like a compressor or like a squeeze, you know, I think we call some of them. And then every plugin's got a decorator knob, uh. which is kind of my email. It's my handle. Yeah. You know, somebody goes, hey, can you decorate my music? Decorator. That's like amazing. way back in the 90s. And it's just stuck with me since then. So every plug and when you hit the decorate button, that's kind of the finishing thing where the limiters kick in and the squeeze and all that stuff. So, cool. but they're, they're doing great. They've asked me to do, uh, I'm doing a couple more with them. A couple other plugins that are in progress right now uh they had me do a drum 
sample library from their one shots pack called drum shots and uh yeah it's great that's awesome it's and great. how does that does that is that something at the end of the year financially you're like yeah man let's do that again yeah. or is it something like ah, it's more about getting a brand out both both yeah. both yep depending on how popular it is obviously and this this one's done pretty good so uh, and it's what I call mailbox money. It'll always come in, you know? Right. And if for some reason I hit, engineers go like this, you know? You're, you're nobody, and then all of a sudden you mix, boom, you know, the next big thing, and then everybody's knocking on your door. And it's always cyclic, you know? It goes up and down. So if, say I'm... So some days you're only mixing about 18 or 19 <laughs> songs. I get it. If I hit that cycle way up here, all of a sudden I'll start moving a lot of software you know right. so it's good to do as many as possible and then you know that's cool it'll be grandkid college money that's, that's why awesome, i look man. at it you and know? your daughter is i saw you in the studio with your daughter she is unfortunately she got the bug and she's actually really good <laughs> unfortunately <laughs> i thought you meant COVID. i was like <laughs> okay yeah got it other bug so she uh she is writing songs and didn't want to go to college. And I said, no, 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 no. I want you to go to college. I did, you know, it's I always have a good fallback. So she agreed and I talked her into majoring in music. So I said, while you're there, you might as well do something that'll benefit you. You know, one of the biggest things I regret is not having a theory background. Me too. Boy, Same when thing. I was in tune and vocals in uh, Ilya Tolshinsky came in. He's like, yeah, just put auto tune on that. Take the sharp fifth diminished off. Take that note off. Add that, that, that. Hit play, and it's like boom. Yeah. Like thirty seconds later, it's done. I'm like, how'd you do that? He's like, duh, it's theory, it's music. <laughs> right. Yeah. And I'm like, I had no idea. I just know that's the key of C. Maybe major, maybe chromatic. I, <laughs> the hell, I don't even know what that means. <laughs> yeah, for most people, auto tune is, that a G is chord? like put it in put it in the major key, and then if that doesn't work, just hit chromatic. Yes, yeah. that's the extent of most people. Yeah. So I was like, boy, if you could have that background, and then it'll help her with her songwriting. She's doing piano and all that. So. So now she can come in and tell you. Oh, yeah, yeah. Actually, she uh, has been doing a lot of background work for me because she wanted to sing, and I'm like, you know what? I'm going to train this girl like I want a background singer That's to cool. be. So she's come in, and she's kind of learned. Yeah, what a she, lesson, huh, oh, working it's, with you. It's great because I can actually yell at her, you know what I mean? And she doesn't take offense at it, whereas other people, I'm like, do you think me? I'm like, what are you doing? That sounds terrible. <laughs> Get closer to the mic. Back up. Don't, don't She's in the fetal position in the actual exactly. yeah, booth. But it'll, it'll, it, it's really toughened her up, and she'll actually come in, and like if you did a session, she'd be like, boy, could you maybe drop a little 2K in my phone? That's a little brittle. I'm like, wow. <laughs> Somebody did. That, that worked. Uh, that's like a proud Does dad your studio moment. have a tracking room? Pardon? Do you have a tracking room at your studio? I've got an overdub booth. Okay. So, so it's just like your mix room and you got an over, over to booth. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I very rarely cut vocals. Uh, the majority of stuff is just mixing, but I have it there in case somebody, and I've got some guitars and some amps and stuff. How, so how if you, somebody needs to like fix a G chord that's right. out of tune, just like, oh, go How ahead. do you deal with like, a, are you sitting there doing vocal tuning or are you saying, hey, get that done before it gets to me? Uh, or editing drums? Yeah. Uh, most times on the record stuff, it's all done. Uh, indie stuff, a lot more it's done too. I always will go in and fix anything though because at the end of the day, you're only as good as the last thing you've done. So I don't want something going out that sounds out of tune or something like that. Right. No one, I could have fixed that. So it's as much for you as it is for them. Yeah, because they're still going to blame me. They're like, oh, that sounds like shit. Decker makes right. that, you know? So it, right. I make sure everything goes out 100%. So yes, I will. I can line draw. I used to do a bunch of that. I can edit drums. I have a real fast, efficient way of doing that. Uh, at the end of the day, the only way to get that stuff right, though, is just good old-fashioned elbow grease. Yeah, I mean, yeah. if something, you just got to draw it out, and it'll take a little time, you know, but... So it takes a mix from 45 minutes to... <laughs> to about 48. <laughs> no, seriously, you're that quick at that stuff as well? Uh, be honest to... To tune a lead vocal, it takes me about an hour to draw it yeah. out. I'm not that. And are you using Melodyne or Auto Tune? To auto Tune. Do yeah. auto -tune. I don't even know how to use Melodyne. Graphic mode and Auto Tune. Yeah. 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 yeah Melodyne is, is I, I've used the graphic interface in Auto Tune and Melodyne. I've heard it's cool. Is 
is pretty incredible. And I know it just enough to like, someone thinks you know what you're doing, but there's guys out there that, that oh, yeah. can change the, the entire thing with Melodyne. Um, and what's dude um, from um, the old Emerald? For what? Your buddy, the, oh, Chris, Chris Utley. Chris Utley, yeah. Chris is one of those guys that as you're doing it, he's comping, you know, he's a, one of the fastest tracking engineers, you know, adding harmony vocals to it. You know, it's like Mike had a record that he had done there and, and the refs, he said, oh, I, I just threw in these background vocals that he generated through autotune and, and through Melodyne. And it was like, I wouldn't have complained about them. Yeah, yeah, I'm a yeah, record no. producer. I wouldn't have, wouldn't have complained about them if it went out yeah, like you, that. You tuck them in a little bit, you never know. He's so it's... fast. Yeah, he's, he's fantastic. Good, yeah. good, good, good friend. There's so many so. like lethal dudes in town, and it's the same thing with the session musicians. It's like the reason we have, I mean, I think we're as good, maybe the best with session musicians, but there's brilliant guys in other, in other cities and around the world. The reason why... I give the edge to Nashville because they're doing it in triples every day. Every day. So if you're Leland Scalar, I mean, you're busy, but Mark Hill is probably behind his base more than Leland is. Oh, yeah. You know, just because yeah. of the way this economy works down here. And part of the byproduct as an engineer and as a session musician and a producer and a songwriter, these things happen so fast. People talk about writing songs over three, four months. When I was a kid, I would write a song. It'd take me a half a year to write a song. Mm -hmm. And the thought of going into a room in Nashville and three, four hours be done with a song was like, I can't do that. Back in the heyday, I mixed 1,500 songs. 1,498, I think, was the actual number I tallied up in one year. That was like wow. back when it was just throw and That's go, five, amazing. five, five, you know? Yeah, There's something cool that happens, though. When you get into a groove and you're so busy, people will listen to those mixes and say, Oh, Billy, when you did that, you don't even remember the mix. Mm -hmm. But it's like they'll say, oh, that sound, how did you get it? You must have, and it was just like, we just did it. Yeah. And it was like, it becomes famous almost afterwards. Like when you listen to some of the songs from the 70s, some of them are pretty bad, but you memorize them like demoitis, and they almost have a, more of a charm because they were just done so quickly. They're, all the inspiration was left on the reel rather than sometimes when you work for hours and hours, you start to slowly disassemble all the energy in a song. Mm-hmm. You know, so that's a cool thing about Nashville. And that's why, you know, and it's still that way for the most part. It's just so fast moving. Engineers come in, get sounds, record five songs in three hours. Mm -hmm. right. And getting a drum sound where in the old days we'd go to upstate New York and be in one of these rooms on the Hudson Valley and we'd book the first day to get drum sounds. Mm -hmm. And you're like tenting. You're like, oh, let's try FET 47. And you sit in the control for 20 minutes, you know. <laughs> But drum you, sounds in town happen in ten minutes. Oh yeah, but do you remember that? Killer. That was also the quote unquote curse of Nashville when everybody started saying everything sounds the same because it was the same studio, same engineer, right. same yeah. musician, same producer. Remember when, when oh, Nashville yeah. went through that? Everybody's like, man, it just sounds the same. You know, yeah. it's all paint by numbers. You know. Yeah. But no, I agree. It's. Uh, What's that saying? You need to do something 10,000 hours before you become proficient Master, or expert? Yeah. 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 Obviously, way past that, you know, yeah. if you're playing bass triples every now, day for 10, 20 years, you know? Tell me you're like 100,000 hours into this, right? Oh, I would think, yeah. So do you ever feel like, oh, I'm kind of ripping myself off? I don't give myself the opportunity to go do something truly unique and different because I'm so stuck in my templates? Uh, I've... Recently, yeah, I'll, I'll go where I get bored of it, you know, and, and I'll like call somebody and say, please send me a new drum sound or a sample or something. But what I like to do is find stuff that I can't do that still makes me go, oh, wow. There was a band called Motionless and White and a guy who I got to meet and now I'm, you know, Facebook friends, Instagram friends with him. I actually talked to him a bunch and met him out in California when I was at uh, the NAMM show, Josh Wilbur. Uh, he came up underneath Andy Wallace, all mm. those great records and stuff. But he mixed a band called Motionless and White, and their, the song was called Loud, I think. And I was just like, how does he do that? That's just unbelievable, yeah. you know? That's the best. So I would go in on my days off. I still like to practice, you know? I still love what I'm doing. So even if I don't have anything to do, I'll go in, try new combinations, new samples, maybe a new technique, yeah. you know? Nine times out of 10, I'll refer back to what I'm doing just because I'm so comfortable with it. But 
I can kind of squeeze a few things in there. And yes. part of the reason people come to you is to make the donuts. True. So you got to give them a donut. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You can maybe change it. Maybe it's a frosted donut or, you know, you can try to be creative. But you want to keep a consistency whenever you're doing 1,500 songs a year. Hey, I mean, They're people... coming to you for your thing. Right. right. Yeah. yeah. I tell everybody I'm like the best medium dollar guy in town. <laughs> you may not like what I do, but... You won't miss a pitch. You won't right. miss a deadline. Yeah. You'll walk out smiling, you know, and I remember, it'll be fun. I remember years ago, I had done something that my publisher liked. My publisher was Tim Hunzi. Oh, right? yeah. Oh, I know is your <laughs> friend. And, he, and I had mixed it. I mean, I, I tried my damnedest to mix this thing. He's like, that's cool. You know, we should probably get like Billy Decker to mix this. <laughs> he goes, you know, this song is... But to him, it was worth... Thank you, Tim. Yeah, it was worth the... <laughs> The expense of taking it to somebody, you know, it's just people are hearing it that you get that first shot to hear it. Right. You know, and yeah, he was, he's a big fan of yours. Well, that's, that's good to hear. That's it's, I think it's hear. cool too that people can, you haven't priced yourself out. I tell everybody I will find a way to make it work. You know that's what I mean? Amazing. Somebody would call me and they'll be that's, like, man, we really can't afford That's rare, I think. You and know, I'm a guy just, that's as busy as you to yeah. be able to say, oh, yeah, I'll still do, I'll well, still do your record. It might take me a little longer. That's why I'm as busy as I am because I, right. I don't say no, you know? Your attitude is literally different than any other <laughs> yeah, I, ever I, encountered. I agree. It's kind of incredible. There's a certain ego in being able to reject work and say, I don't do that anymore. It's oh, like, oh, yeah, it means no, I've graduated. No. I'll take. That's I mean, amazing, man. That's but you, really but you will cool. find that John you, Brown in Idaho can call me, and I'll put him at the top of the list. You but know? if John Brown, the problem I have with that is that whenever I get those records, I do have to edit drums. I do have to oh, tune vocals. Yeah. I do have to go through more revisions because to get all the way back to where we were. Sure. Because it's just a bit of a hand holding through the process. They haven't done their ten thousand hours. Right. So it, it's a lot more time consuming working with folks who don't really do it. And I always try to like I really want to be that guy that's like, this is your record, man. You're going to live with it. Hopefully, ten years from now, you'll still be proud of it. Mm -hmm. I want it to be what you. I want to be able to make sure that it's right. But I want to make sure that it really is your record, right? And most people don't just do one record. Right. Most people right. do multiple. So you take care of John Brown from Idaho. Go that extra mile, tune his vocals, lock his drums. Yeah. That dude's going to put tennis shoes on your kids and for the rest to, of his life. And every other band in this town in Idaho is going to be calling exactly. you. Exactly. And the guys, I remember as a kid, I slowly learned, like, I would get a record, and then the drummer on the record would say, hey, will you do my, this other project, mm -hmm. and the guitar play? I would get one or two records from every record I did, and then hopefully get the record after. I wasn't really good at getting the record after when I started. Right. But then I started to see the value and say, oh, I can do five to ten records with a band. And it's like, but you you got to treat it not like a smash and grab. Not right, like, oh, right. we're, we're already through this. Like contractors treat you when they build your house, sure. right? They know that you're not going to build another house with them. So they don't care. It, I found it's hard to be a jerk. It takes so much energy to be mad and fight with people and be like, oh, my snare is the best way to go. You didn't like that? Screw you. You know, it's like, Why? Right. You know, just be nice. I don't think that's as natural as you think it is. I think it's so wrapped up in people's egos. As a mix engineer, it is a super creative process. So when they get your mix and you don't hear back from them, or you hear back in the first paragraph is revisions, or this is way off, the first line is. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I get that. It's get a little soul-crushing for people. Yeah. And, they, and their response to that is usually like, they want to strike out again. Like, right. it's, it's like, some, you just insulted me. How dare you, right? And I did your record, and you're from Idaho. <laughs> On top of that. Uh, but the reality is it's a learned behavior, and it is. Like, once you get into it, there's almost this acceleration of the relationship. Once they realize that you're on the record, and you want them to win, and you want them to get the sound that they're searching for, and if they're searching, they can't find the words. I'm doing a record right now from Italy, and the language barrier is odd because they want more pump but less compression, right? And you're like, you're oh, trying yeah. to figure out what is what are you saying to me, right? And but when they see you struggling to like get to the bottom of it, and they say this guy's on my team, Absolutely. well, then it's like they don't want to go and make another record without you, which yeah. is how people make careers. Rather than say I was in the music business from eighteen to twenty-two, and then I went out because I couldn't. <laughs> the people that survive. How many years have you been doing it? Mm, since I graduated from Full Sail, ninety nineteen ninety. Okay, so thirty years. Hmm? Damn. 
30 years, right? <laughs> you don't get to 30 years without understanding the sociology of making records. Mixing is, I tell everybody, 90% people skills, 10% mixing skills. Wow. That's interesting. Yeah. Do you have any tricks? Like a lot of folks will, when they're sending mixes over, will send multiple mixes. We'll do something like so that people can... A lot of times A&R guys would, just to have a voice on the record, would make a comment on the snare. I was working on a record in New York, and we were so busy that they said, just send the same mix and title, retitle it. And the A&R guy, sure enough, said, perfect, thanks. So mm -hmm. much better, right? You know, Because people have a need to be creatively involved. They, they want to say, hey, but I had Billy go ahead and bring the snare, make it a little brighter. Sure. Now it's right. Sure. Uh, I know what you're talking about, and... I usually don't do that, but there was one instance where I got a phone book of revisions. You know what I mean? Every single instrument, and there was synth, stuff like that. I'm like, a friend of mine was in, taking over for me. I'm like, watch this. I turned the vocal up like a dB and a half, reprinted it, sent it back. He's like, fuck yeah. <laughs> But I, please, please, don't, don't think I do that all the time. That was just a one and done That's thing. That's amazing. Yeah. That's funny. But it, I did it just to kind of prove a point, you know, to do show Do you ever get into a mix where you're working with someone and say, hey, bring up the kick drum. Hey, bring up the snare. Hey, bring up the bass. Hey, bring up the guitar. And then halfway through the concert, you realize, oh, he wants it louder. He just wants <laughs> the record louder. We're rebuilding this mix across the board one dB at a time. Does, does anybody ever attend your sessions? Yeah, yeah. I get a lot of people uh, that will come in and sit and tweak, even on demos, indie stuff. But like stuff. while you're doing the initial mix? No, usually I try to say, <laughs> give, me, give me that 45 yeah, give me, minutes, yeah, give me a second, and yeah. then you can come hang with me the rest of the afternoon, right. but let me do my thing, you know? Yeah. Well, and tell me what you think of this, because I always felt like, out of the, in their best interest, I say, hey, keep in mind, you don't know my, you're sitting on my couch and you don't know my monitors. Um, well, let me send you a mix, listen on your headphones that you listen, in mm -hmm. your car, listen to wherever you listen to music, and then, you know, then let's, you can come in and we'll revise it. But, you know, it's got to be, it's next to impossible to sit on a couch and really yeah. be able to comment on monitors that you don't know in a room that you don't know. That, so I do that every day. I'll mix and I say, okay, well, actually, you know what? Let me show you this. If somebody calls me to mix, this is what, for an indie, this is what I will send them. Uh, right there. But I substitute their name. You can read that out loud if you want. It's just a picture of a middle finger. <laughs> <laughs> hey, bud, thanks for reaching out. I'd love to mix for you. For independent releases, I am 500 per song. That includes all versions and unlimited recalls and tweaks to your 100% happy. My turnaround time is usually within 24 hours of receiving the files as all I do is mix. Also, with first-time clients uh, not in my billing system, I require payment up front. After the first time, we are all good with a net 30, et cetera. As I mix within Pro Tools, you can just send me the session. If not, then consolidate WAV files all the same length is fine via Dropbox, we transfer Hightail, etc. Once I get the files all downloaded and ready to go, I will call you to get a direction and notes. That's cool. So I don't uh, end up making you sound like Britney Spears. <laughs> I did that no for you, offense, Mike. Mike. I you. did that for you. <laughs> Thank you. That's Talk amazing. Soon. <laughs> That's funny. That's but yeah, amazing. if, if somebody, because I have to type the same thing for yeah. everybody asking if I want to do like a, for an indie thing, yeah. you know, and I've got a master one and a, a demo thing, but it's just. You're highly automated. Yes. Yeah. It's kind of genius, man. It's I'm like, genius. I got to say, I'm like blown You got a franchise but... is what you got to do. <laughs> yeah. Just get some like. Some the minions, a hundred people mixing for you. Yeah, I just I really enjoy what I do, you know. Cool. And I don't and I it don't shows. I don't take it for granted. I don't want it to go away. Mm. And the fastest way to make it go away is to be that guy. Yeah. And I just don't want to, you know. Yeah, it's cool. It's really so. smart. Do you have a great music business story? <sighs> yes. Uh, I grew up. With, oh, my headphones are going. There we go. I grew up listening to a bunch of Chris Lord Algae stuff. Worshiped the ground he walked on. Um, big sample guy back in the day. I was at Soundstage. Uh, the studio manager there used to work out in California, uh, Northern California. Chris and he were pretty good friends. Chris Lord Algae was in town speaking at Blackbird. Stopped over to see his buddy, which was my studio manager at Soundstage. I was up mixing in the front, 
he comes in and says hi to the studio manager. And the studio manager is like, Chris, before you leave, do me a favor. There's this kid named Billy Decker. All he does is he thinks you've got golden slippers on. Just Chris Ordagi this, Chris Ordagi that. He just, he wants to be you. If you could just go say hi, you'll make this kid's day. You know what I mean? So I'm in mixing, doing Pro Tools. All of a sudden I hear, hey. And I turn around and Chris Ordagi standing behind me. <laughs> And all I did was get up and I gave him a hug. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. He goes, hey, I heard you're trying to be me. He goes, I can't stop you, but I can at least make sure you ain't going to fuck it up. <laughs> he, cool. goes, he goes, show me what you're doing. <clears throat> he literally took about 30 minutes, went through every single channel wow. and goes, yes, no. Oh, that's kind of cool. Don't ever do that again. That's fucking stupid. That's terrible. <laughs> he goes, why are you doing that? Blah, blah, blah. Went through every single thing. And at the end of that, he validated that what I was doing, basically being self-taught other than going to a recording school back in the day, that what I was doing was right and it was okay. Wow. And from that point on, I got this confidence yeah. that was just like, okay, right. you know? Yeah, that's cool. Man. I'm, I'm out of diapers now. That's you know? really cool. I can start playing with some other kids on the playground and I can kind of keep up, you know? You know what's really... Uh, and you do it well, is being able to keep your ego in check, right? Being capable to work on multiple income oh, en levels. Oh, enough about me, Joe. Let's talk about me. <laughs> Don't you know who I think I am? Well, that's just it. It's like, it's like you're super approachable. You'll work with anybody. Uh, you're committed to the work. And then on top of it, it's like you're still really super humble. But you've got this, uh, this confidence that people want when you go into a mix engineer or go into a recording session with a great engineer, it brings such peace to everybody in the room because they know it's a good ego, right? It's, yeah. it's good arrogance. Yeah. Not even arrogance because connotatively that's the wrong word. But there's a confidence that's really a special thing. It's like people want to know that you're in charge and you've got it. Right. And so now they're just, their brain's just in creative world. It's like, what if we did this cool thing over in the left speaker and did this thing that went across? And Rather than wondering if this, the ship is a stable, floatable ship. Right. right. Right? And that's a delicate balance because some guys continue on with that and they become untenable. You can't even be in the room with them. You can't deal with them. The thing I think gives me the most confidence, I guess, is for doing it this long and is much as I research and read, I'm a big, like, I don't just take stuff at face value. I have to find out how it works, you know, other than plugins. If I see a plugin work, I don't care about that. You know? <laughs> I can't even install my own plugins. Right. You know? But as far as like learning compression, EQ, stuff like that, when you come in, I'm at the point right now where you can say, hey, can we do that? And I can go, yeah, actually, I really don't think there's anything I can't do. If I don't know, I can probably pick up the phone and call Joe or Mike, and they will. I know somebody who does know how to do it, yeah. and I can pull that card. Yeah. But I think that gives you the maybe that confidence you're talking about, just knowing that there's really nothing you can't do with as many tools as, a, as are available nowadays. It's a consequence of 30 years of working hard probably, at it. Probably, yeah. I mean, it's not yeah. even like braggable. I tell people all the time in the school, we have a, a small school, audio school, and it's like, You've been tying your shoes since you were three years old. Mm -hmm. No one's going to tell you you're not tying your shoes right. You might see another way to tie them, but there's a confidence. And it's like it, the, becoming a great mix engineer somewhat becomes like tying your shoes after you do it for 30 years. I did, it, I did learn how to retie my shoes, though, when my kids were a little bit younger. We went to Florida and a good friend of ours is a stunt woman and a stunt man. And she was like Rebecca Romaine Stamos' double in X-Men. And he worked for Cirque de Soleil. Mm. And my daughter came up, her shoes were untied. And I'm like, started to tie them. She was probably seven years old. He's like, whoa, 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 let me get it. He's a rigger, right? Oh, wow. Everything off the floor. He's, he tied the regular knot. Then he did another bow and they don't come untied. Yeah. So a seven-year-old's shoes will not come They've untied. been on for 14 years. <laughs> but you can still pull the one thing and they come apart. You got to arc oh, well. So see, you can relearn I to tie your shoes. I do the double knot, but I don't, I don't get the one pull. <laughs> well, that's the, and only from a rigger, you know, from That's the brilliant select. part of being creative. It's like you can, you can find other ways, but you still have a confidence. When someone comes into your room and says, hey, I don't know what this is, but I want to do this. And you can be like, Rather than have fear click in, which is the right. most people are like, all right, I'm going to be revealed that I'm incompetent. You're like excited about the challenge and you go do something you've never done before. Mm -hmm. It's a cool place to be. 
It really is. I've been really diving into the rock and the hard rock world and the metal. I've got to work on a few things with Joey Sturgis and whatnot. And uh, it's really fun, just bass, guitar, and drums. Yeah, yeah. Because in Nashville, I'll get scolded for putting too much snap in the kick. You know, it's too clicky. It sounds like metallic or something. They love that metal. They yeah. put more in. Yeah, you know, yeah. can you make it clickier? That's like, super interesting. Woo! You know, it's like you go to, a, if you do a metal record, it's like a lot of 10K. Mm -hmm. Right, you can crank 10k, and 10k is very high. Like most beater and tom ping is around 6k, and that's where you live. And you know, 10k, you're getting up into like what feels like air. But in that world, you can't do that in the country world. So when you mix a metal record, it's almost like you've got to learn a whole new way to deal with the same thing that we consider music. It's like the whole mix lives in a different, different space. Mm -hmm. That's cool. I've to always loved rock records. It's just so much fun when I get to do them. It's like. You almost feel like it's a guilty pleasure, right? Oh, yeah. I tell everybody, rock sues the soul, country pays the bills. That's cool. <laughs> but I actually think country is harder to mix because you have so much mm -hmm. stuff right here. All your acoustic instruments, the right hand of the piano, the steel, bazooki, guitar, That's banjo. All, it's all right there. Vocals, you know? So I think learning how to mix country first has made me different when I approach the harder stuff you know everybody's like oh that sounds not like what we're used to you know they have a certain thing they do in metal you know and when I do something like that they're like oh that doesn't sound like what we're used to it's cool but it's definitely different you know yeah. and I think that comes from having to find places for everything over there you know in in the country world well dude you've been great thank you so much for hanging out with us if thank people, you for having if, me if people want to hire Billy Decker how do they do it? They uh, grab $2, pay a commission of one to Mike, the other one to you, and your son will like carry the chain. No. Uh, you can... Do you have a website? I do. It's billydecker.com. Uh, and all you have to do is call anybody in Nashville. I've been around for 30 years. Yeah. Somebody's got my template and my phone number. So if you want to you hear should, one of those... You, you should be on Facebook <laughs> selling those templates is what you should be doing. Well, the thing is, is everybody's got them. Nobody yeah. wants it. There's, I, I mean, think about how many songs I've mixed over the years and all the publishers archive all those Pro Tools stuff. I mean, right. you can walk yeah, down the street and Yeah, but they haven't put them together. Rock. You got to put them together. <laughs> yeah, and here's the other, before we go, the other thing that's really cool is you're working on archaic equipment you're on pro tools 10 yeah i mean this is like horse and buggy it's it goes to show you it's not you know it's, get a good set of converters a good clock make sure that mm -hmm. but it's like this is it's about the person so billy decker will mix your record or your demo uh go find him at billydecker.com we want to thank him for coming and being such a good dude thank you for and having me he's an institution here in nashville and you can um you can be working with him so reach out to him say hello remember to like and subscribe wherever you're listening to this whether it be on youtube hit notifications do all the bells and whistles also on uh, spotify and apple play go ahead or google play go ahead and just wherever you're listening bookmark us uh hit subscribe and get notified when we put out new content thank you for hanging out with us uh we're signing off here with billy decker from the west Barn. thanks billy we'll see you next time thanks mike thanks joe